Okay, um, so good evening, everybody, and welcome to our uh, chapter meeting for the Southway Conservationists. I'd like to give you a, a brief um, review of some of the things that are coming up in the chapter, but then we get to the main event, which is where we're welcoming our keynote speaker, Courtney Russo, and she'll be introduced in a moment uh, by our Vice President, John Kinsella, and she'll talk about the wonders of the Purple Martins. Just real quick, some of the upcoming things, we, we're keeping pretty active, even though it's winter, um, like today, we're, this is the one on the upper left, we went to Groundhog Day in Garner, uh, which was a lot of fun, and uh, predictably, uh, the Groundhog accurately forecasted another six months, I mean, another six months, another six weeks of winter. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, however, we were outdoors and it was a bit chilly because it was raining and, and 37 degrees, but I think a lot of kids came through and it didn't bother them a bit. We were shivering, but they were great. Um, we got on February 4th, we have a guided bird tour. Actually, this is the uh, Wildlife Federation, so more than one chapter will participate in this one coming up at the Art Park in Raleigh. Uh, on February 11th, we're going to have a, an event at February, at um, Bass Lake Park, and that'll be a waterfowl walk. And there's a lot of, a wide variety of, of uh, waterfowl that you can see this time of year at Bass Lake. So it'll be pretty fun. Um, you know, we've got the great blue heron you see here. We have um, uh, coots, we have cormorants, we have a lot of different birds. So it'll be, it'll be a fun, a fun walk. Uh, February 21st, uh, we'll be maintaining some of our seven different uh, pollinator gardens. John uh, looks after those and, and as the Garden for Wildlife Chair. And uh, here we are working on Millbrook, and that's where we're going to be doing it on February 21st, a little bit of maintenance. On the 25th, we'll go down to Lillington, which is the Cape Fear watershed, and we'll pick up litter and try and keep those plastic pieces going into the river and eventually getting out into the ocean. So we do this periodically. And then finally, uh, our next event, uh, which is uh, both a webinar and a live event in Holly Springs at Bass Lake Park, uh, Dr. Bob Brown will be speaking to us about the chronic wasting disease and the impact on deer populations. And that's, uh, that's become much more prominent uh, this year. So that's a very important topic to, uh, to learn about. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Most of all, I want to encourage you to visit our website. You'll see it on the bottom and uh, check out things that are going on and join us if you can. In person, if you're in the in the area, we'd love to have you. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to John. Okay. Thanks, Monty. And it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's guest speaker, Courtney Rousseau. Excuse my, my voice. but uh, Courtney earned a degree in animal science from North Carolina State University. She co-founded the North Carolina Purple, Mount, Purple Martin Society in 2010 on an informal basis. She did that with uh, an individual named Tim Francis. And in 2021, she had the Society Incorporated. Courtney is currently the president of the Society, and she's been very actively involved in hands-on Purple Martin conservation projects, public education, and scientific research through assisting in banding projects. And to me, that sounds really interesting. So she has a lot to talk about tonight. So without further ado, I'm happy to turn the program over to Courtney. I will jump in real quick. Um, so my name is my name is Luke. I work for the Wildlife Federation, and you know we're really so glad you all joined us um, tonight to talk about purple martins. Um, just some some technical uh, some technical things to go over. If you'd like to ask a question tonight, please type that question into the chat or into the Q and A, and one of us will read the question to Courtney at the conclusion of her presentation. Um, we'll make sure to save some time at the end. And if there's any questions that we don't have time to get to tonight, we'll make sure. To include the um, to include the answer in a follow up email. Um, okay, so now without further ado, I'm going to hand the the virtual mic over to Courtney. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. All right, just get this started here.
So just a little bit about our organization uh, very quickly. We are a registered 501c3 nonprofit. And a little bit about our mission here, as was mentioned earlier, it's basically Purple Martin Preservation. And we do that through several ways, uh, basically hands-on conservation projects and public education in events like this, scientific research through banding projects and collaboration with other like-minded conservation groups like South Lake Conservationists and North Carolina Wildlife Federation. We are affiliated with the PMCA. And if you want more information about our group, you can check us out on that website right there at ncpurplemartin.org. So a little bit about what we're gonna be learning today. So it's gonna be a little bit of everything about Martins. So I'm gonna throw a whole lot of information at you and uh, you may find that you have a question. I may end up covering uh, whatever it is that you uh, want to know more about, but if not, um, feel free to ask a question at the end of the presentation that was mentioned earlier. But we're gonna be talking about the biology and the history of the Purple Martin and management techniques for managing a Purple Martin colony. We're gonna be talking about um, Martin projects that the NCPMS is involved in and how you can get involved with Purple Martins where you are. So a little bit of birding by ear here. So quite a unique sound that the Purple Martin has, the largest member of the Swallow family there. So here are two adult Martins. Um, there, the male is on the right and the female is on the left. They are cavity nesting swallow species. And today they use gourds and martin houses almost exclusively. And I'll talk a little bit more about that further on in the presentation. A little bit about the history of purple martins. Um, Native Americans were known to hang gourds for purple martins. So this was uh, done in several tribes in the Southeast. The Choctaw and the Chickasaw tribes were two that were documented to put up gourds for purple martins. So it is not a, a new tradition. It was something that has been occurring for a very long time. So a little bit more uh, history there. This is a, a neat old picture from 1892 in Nebraska. You can see uh, those guys there on their farm with their old Purple Martin house. Just kind of neat to see it in history like that. So a little bit about identifying Martin. So this is an adult male Martin. That is the one that's an ASY male. So after second year, you may hear uh, Martin people talking about, hey, they've got an ASY male or an ASY female Martin visiting their colony. And that's what that little lingo means. That's the definition there for you. So a um, Martin has to be, a uh, male Martin has to be at least two years of age to get this nice purple coloration. So here's an ASY or after second year female, an adult female here. You see how she looks a whole lot different than the male. She's got a little more brownish coloration on her, but you can still see some purple here on her shoulders and on the back of her head and a little bit on the back there. You also notice that this area under the tail, which is called the chrism, has some brown splotching on it. And I'll show you in a minute why that's important for identification. So here we've got subadults or second year or subby birds. This is a subadult male. Now the subadult male is what we like to call a purple polka dotted boy. So he's starting to get some purple feathers and how many purple feathers he has really uh, depends on the individual. So they can all look a little bit different, but you can see he's not fully purple. So he's a year old, but he's starting to get some purple speckles and splotches. They also can make the same vocalization as the adult male that has a little click on the end of it. And that's the vocalization that I played for you earlier in the slide. Subadult males generally show up later at a colony than the adult males in the season. So now a uh, second year or subby or subadult female. So you see how brown she is, not a whole lot of purple on her. And if you look at this chrism area here under her tail, you'll see how white that is compared to how dark brown it was on the adult female. Also, she doesn't have purple shoulders. And I've noticed on some uh, subadult females, their forehead almost looks kind of whitish. So they're a lot lighter in coloration than the adult females. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Martins and their breeding range. So as you can see on this map, this shows uh, where you can find uh, purple Martins in the United States and North America. So we have three subspecies of purple Martins. One is Prognisubis asperia, 
One is Prognosubis subis and one is Prognosubis arboricola. Prognosubis subis is the one that we see that nests in marten houses and in gourds, and that species is found east of the Rocky Mountains in this area of the country here. That's the one that is primarily imprinted on um, housing provided by man. So Prognosubis hesperia is found in the desert southwest and nests in holes in cacti that are created by woodpeckers. So that would make them a secondary cavity nesting species, as well as Prognosubis arboricola, which is found on the west coast over here around um, California and uh, up north on the west part of the coast there. So you can look at the dates and you can see in the spring when martins start to come back to North America. That migration is happening right now, believe it or not. And there have been martins reported already in uh, Florida and Texas and Louisiana and Georgia. And there was already a report this week in South Carolina. And here we are at the beginning of February. So I really like to call them spring and early summer birds. They don't generally stay with us for the whole summer. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on in the presentation. So they breed in the Northern hemisphere and winter in the Southern hemisphere. So after they've raised their only one brood per year that they have, then after those young have fledged, they will start forming groups and migrating South again. And they um, will spend the uh, winter in the Southern hemisphere. And um, you can see through these arrows, the paths that they take to migrate up and down. I'll talk a little bit more about that, how we've uh, tracked their migration paths. That's pretty interesting. So purple martins need our help. Uh, population trends for purple martins have gone down and they're estimating it's about a 33% loss in population between 1970 and 2021. And the reasons for that are many. Um, the main reason is people are not putting up housing for them as often as they did. People are losing interest in putting up housing for them. And they have had to compete with invasive species for uh, nesting sites. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And also there have been is issues with loss of insect prey because they are insectivores. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's talk a little bit about migration. So you may hear people refer to something called scouts. So all a scout really is in terms of uh, Martin lingo is the oldest purple Martin that arrives back at the colony site where it successfully bred the previous year. So those older adult martins come back first and the subadults, which we showed you those slides earlier, they come back later in the spring, usually as the slide says about four to six weeks later. So a little bit of a myth buster for you here. Scouts do not go and find a colony then turn around, fly back to Brazil to recruit more martins and then fly all the way back up to North America again. That's not what they're doing. So the first martin that comes back to the colony, the scout as you were, wants to get the best nesting site at their chosen colony. So they may nest in the same gourd or the same housing compartment that they used last year, or they just may pick a different gourd at that same site. But what they do is they, they show high site fidelity. So if they successfully bred in a colony that previous year at that previous site and fledged their young, they will return back to that same exact colony site the following year. So in this picture here, you can see where this landlord has has got his uh, platform for his house here, but he hasn't put the house up yet, but the Martins are sitting there. They're saying, oh, well, I'm here, where's my house? So they're waiting for their landlord to put up the housing for them. In this picture, these are Martins that have just crossed the Gulf of Mexico in a flock and they are exhausted and they're landing on the first thing they can find and they're resting on these houses here on the Gulf. So a little bit more about migration. It's really amazing uh, what martins can do in the, in the north and the south in their uh, migration in the spring and in the fall. So um, as I mentioned earlier, they start migrating north pretty early. And um, for an insectivore, that's pretty amazing how, um, how early they start migrating north. Now in the summer, um, in our area, is generally about uh, end of June uh, through July and sometimes the first week or two of August, you will see martins uh, gather in pre-migratory roosts and they will um, roost on places um, like I'll show you in these slides here. Um, Umstead Bridge in Mans Harbor is a famous roost site. 
And uh, what they'll do is they'll congregate in big numbers. You'll see them come in at sunset. They'll form like this whirling tornado overhead of, of all these martins, and they'll all come down at once. And what they have done in uh, Man's Harbor is they'll land along the side of the bridge here in these numbers. And they're safe pretty much out there um, on the water where they're away from predators. Now, interestingly enough, in recent years, this roost site is not as active as it has been in past years. That trend may change again. The last couple of years, um, interestingly enough, this other roost site in North Carolina, which is at the uh, phosphate plant in Aurora, which I believe is called Nutrien Phosphate Plant now, that uh, roost site has really gotten a lot bigger. And it's gotten so big that it shows up on Doppler radar. So if you are an early riser like I am in the summer, and you look at your radar app on your phone or on your computer, you can watch these Doppler rings form. And those are martins that are leaving in the morning out of their roost site, and they're dispersing from the roost site to go feed for the day. So here's another example of a, a place that's a roost site in Pennsylvania, in Presque Isle, Pennsylvania. The martins were roosting on these reed beds out here. So a little bit more about um, roost rings. That, as I said earlier, they will show up on radar. And this is one that was actually out in Kentucky. Pretty interesting. You can see the birds dispersing at sunrise. And again, they only form in these big roosts when they are about to migrate, either migrate south or as when they're coming north, they aren't in as big of a group. They tend to migrate more north in smaller groups or singly. But um, in the late summer, and excuse me, early summer and late summer, you will see them in these big groups like this. So a little bit about um, geolocator and GPS studies that they've done with Martins. So this is how tiny this little transmitter is compared to the size of a, a penny. And the PMCA and other researchers have been doing work with Martins to see where they go during migration so they can uh, study um, for conservation reasons um, where um, areas of concern may be in their range. So it's a, like a little backpack fits on their back and it's a pretty small lightweight harness. And this particular bird, interestingly enough, you can see how long it spent in Brazil and in the South America area before it migrated back up in the spring. So it, it started heading south on August 27th. You can see the route that it took. And then it went down over Florida and Cuba across the Yucatan Peninsula and then headed down south before heading back up north and being up at its um, site the following year by May 8th. And this was up in Pennsylvania. So the data for a bird in North Carolina might be slightly different. Uh, we are hoping to do a study for North Carolina birds if we can uh, raise the funds and interest and manpower to do so. It's a big undertaking. I think it would be uh, very interesting uh, to scientists and the public to have that information. So a little bit about uh, purple martins. They don't mate for life. I think this is kind of a funny for you kind of wonder if you could uh, translate this conversation here. There's a female on the left and the male on the right. So nest building and incubation. Um, on the left here, we've got an ASY, that's an adult male here with a green leaf. So interestingly enough, uh, Martins, when they do nest building, they may do it a little different from other birds you've heard about, such as uh, robins, cardinals, or bluebirds. They often put green leaves in their nest. That's one of the identifying features of a martin nest. They don't always have green leaves, but oftentimes they do, especially right before eggs are about to be laid. And sometimes they will um, continue to replenish that supply of green leaves um, until the young are about half grown. So here's a male with a green leaf. He's getting ready to bring it into a nest. This is a female with her brood patch. As the researcher here has kind of uh, blown the feathers back so you can see where the brood patch is. And only the female has the brood patch incubation. These are the eggs. They only, um, they're only incubated for about 16 days. They are white. And then uh, the young may not hatch on the same day. Uh, oftentimes they do, but sometimes there's a day or two between the last um, egg that hatches and the rest of the young. So a little bit about the nestling stage. So um, purple martins take a long time to reach fledging size. So 28 days is a lot longer than some of our uh, songbirds. And the reason for that is they need to be very strong flyers as soon as they fledge. They need to be able to leave that gourd or leave that house compartment and fly strongly up high in the sky with their parents. They aren't going to be hopping around on the ground like some other fledglings, uh, for example, um, 
mockingbirds or thrushes, thrashers. They, they aren't that kind of bird. And actually, if you find a baby martin on the ground, that means something is wrong and it's out of his nest a little too early. So they are in their nest a long time. And then after they fledge, they still then require extra care from their parents, seven to 14 days average. Their parents will teach them how to catch food, how to avoid danger, all of that. They eat, bathe, and drink on the wing. So they have to be able to fly very well when they hatch. Excuse me, when they fledge. <laughs> so a little bit about their diet. They eat only flying insects. They are aerial insectivores. A little bit of vocabulary there for you. They eat a wide variety of flying insects. So they are generalists, which is good if there is an insect decline of a certain species. It's not going to specifically affect a marten, although a general insect decline would affect them as well as other spores. Another myth buster there for you, uh, they aren't great mosquito eaters. They eat almost no mosquitoes. And the reason for that is that mosquitoes fly low to the ground and they're small and the marten is the highest flying of the swallow species and they generally are going after bigger prey. So they eat almost no mosquitoes. Sorry, so that's not a great reason to uh, put up a marten colony site. So a few things that they do eat, um, here you can see some pictures. Uh, this guy's got a, a mouthful of wasps, dragonflies, butterflies. I've seen beetles. I've seen cicadas. Yes, they can eat those big cicadas. I've seen horseflies. They've also been shown to eat flying fire ants, which is nice here in the southeast. But what will happen is they'll catch them on their mating flights when the fire ants have wings. They'll catch a whole bunch of them in their beak, and then they'll go in their nest and feed a big mouthful of them to their young, especially when they have um, small nestlings. So since they are aerial insectivores, they are prone to um, starvation issues when uh, feeding conditions are bad. So what you, you can do as a landlord is you can try feeding them after three days of cold or rainy weather because they will be very hungry and they can starve to death. So how some landlords do this is they offer crickets and mealworms with a, a slingshot or a spoon. And because they are, um, instinctively wanting to catch insects on the wing, the way landlords will train them to feed when the weather is poor, like it is today, this would be a very poor feeding day for a marten, is they will take a cricket or mealworm, put it on a spoon, and then flip that spoon back and then shoot it up in the air. And as it flies by the marten's face, the marten has their feeding instinct triggered. And it may take a few crickets or a few mealworms before they, they really um, are triggered and they'll go after and they'll catch it. And once they've learned that you are throwing food up at them, they will easily then transition to a platform feeder, which is what this picture shows here. And you can also train them to eat scrambled eggs in an emergency. So you may think that's really interesting and I wanna go ahead and put up a Martin house to help them out. Let's get started, but hang on before you do that. Before you put up Martin housing, it is not quite as simple as putting up a Martin house and leaving it. There are factors to consider, and we will be talking about those things. Do you live in the Martin's breeding range? Most likely, yes. If you are east of the Rocky Mountains, which I'm assuming most of our audience is tonight, you probably are in the Martin's breeding range. You can also go to the PMCA's Scout page. If you go to purplemartin.org, uh, they have a link there called the Scout Report, and you can look at um, reports that other people have made of martens coming into their breeding sites and their breeding colonies and kind of see where one of those colonies might be nearby to you to give you an idea of when martens might be in your area. So the next most important thing before you put up martin housing is you need to make sure you have a good site location with open flyways, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute. You see this picture where this guy has a martin house is stuck right there in this tree. That's not a good location for martins. And I will talk about why that is in just a minute. And the next thing is, are you willing to manage the housing? And I will discuss what that means also. So the first thing you need to think about is to choose a wide open location away from trees. So this is where that word flyway comes, in, comes into play here. But what that means is, in this picture here on the left, the, the open flyaway would be this area to the left of this white circle. You can see where my mouse is moving. So you want uh, your distance from trees to be a minimum of 40 feet away from trees or tall shrubs and 30 feet minimum from your house, but not more than 120 feet from your house. Or at the 
who likes to be near people because they know instinctively that being near people means generally less predators. So uh, you want to make sure you are not too close to any nearby tall trees or shrubs. That is the main mistake people make when they put up Martin housing is they put it in the wrong location. So this may be an open field. It may be a pasture. It may be next to a pasture, uh, maybe a farm field in the backyard, or it just might be a new neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of trees. That would be a nice open place. Or if you're in a suburban area at the kind of the end of the neighborhood with a field in the back, that might be a good location also. So another place that people put them up is next to water. So if you have Martin housing on the end of the boat dock, then around water would be a nice open flyway. So in this picture, you see that the Martin housing is not being put up next to this person's house because this person has a lot of trees next to their house and that would interfere with Martin's flyway. So the better uh, location here is gonna be out on the boat dock over here near the, um, the water of the flyway. So we, we tell people don't do it the hard way. So monitoring should be easy and enjoyable. So what does that mean, easy and enjoyable? So in this picture on the left, you can see how this person has put up Martin gourds in an old tree. It looks rustic and it may be similar to the way uh, Native Americans did it a, a long time ago. But the problem here is that these gourds are now inaccessible without climbing on a ladder. So that's not going to be easy, fun or enjoyable if you have to climb up on a ladder every season to manage your Martin housing or clean it out or sit or if a problem occurs, get up there. Now on the top right here, we've got this Martin house that these people have put on a tilt pole. Now a tilt pole is a problem if you have a situation where you need to access the housing during the active season. If you have a nestling that jumps out of housing and you need to put it back or some situation like that, you're not gonna be able to tilt the pole down if it's full of eggs and nestlings. So we do not recommend tilt poles for that reason. Also, it looks like you need more than one person to operate this particular tilt pole. So it's gonna be hard for you to manage if you have to wait to get help if you have your housing on a tilt pole. So we do not recommend those. Now, another situation here on the bottom right, this person has made their own Martin house and it, it's a really nice endeavor, they were handy. But the problem here with this house is the, the compartments are inaccessible. There's no way to open those compartments to do nest checks or clean outs or inspections or anything. So that's going to make it um, a lot harder and a lot less enjoyable to maintain that house if you cannot get into those apartments to do what you need to do. So along those same lines, we uh, tell people to avoid unmanageable housing. So these two are on stationary poles and the compartments do not open. I like to call this one on the left, the Leaning Tower of Martin. You can tell that it's been up for a while. And uh, while this person has a, uh, a nice sleep cheat red roof end, um, you can tell that they're not taking care of the housing here. Uh, if it's leaning, any more on this side of the house has the um, unfortunate chance of having their eggs or young roll out of the house. So this is not an ideal situation here. And this house on the right, actually in the Guinness Book of World Records, has the biggest Martin house ever when it was built. Um, unfortunately, with this situation, uh, you again, again, you have compartments that do not open. It's going to be hard to manage. It's going to be hard to clean out. And while this is neat to look at, and quite a marvel. And this person really, really had some talent to build this house. Courtney, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Courtney, but it seems like your um, yes. your audio's fading in, in and out. Um, I don't know if there's the audio's any, fading in and out. Yeah, I don't know if there's any troubleshooting okay. you can do on your end. All right, is that any better? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. It's um, seems like when you're kind of mm -hmm. leaning forward and leaning to the side, I don't want you to have to stay so stationary the whole time. But okay. All right, well, if it starts doing it again, let me know. Okay, sounds good. All right. So what is manageable housing? What does that mean? So ideally you want to look for housing that raises and lowers easily on a pole, which is gonna be about 12 to 18 feet up in the air. Uh, we do not recommend telescoping poles. Uh, they may be uh, cheap, they may be readily available, but the problem with telescoping poles is the sections can get stuck together and they can suddenly come crashing down and they can uh, disrupt um, eggs or nestlings or young in the house. And also they can um, slide down and pinch your fingers and injure you pretty badly. So we do not recommend people use telescoping poles for those reasons. So what you do want is um, house or gourd that has um, easy access to compartments or gourds. You want the, the doors to open on the house so you can get in there and clean out and maintain whatever you need to do there. 
And then um, you want the cavities to be nice and big. So a Martin is about seven and a half inches long. So you can see why these old six by six uh, compartment sizes that are in some of the older houses are really not the right size for these birds. They are, again, the largest member of the swallow species. They need a nice big compartment. Once you've got a seven and a half inch Martin, male and female, that's two seven and a half inch long birds, plus their fledglings, which are as the same size as the adults when they fledge, you can see why they need all that room. So nice big cavities. And um, you want a gourd that will open with a um, access cap. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. And then starling resistant entrances. We'll talk about why that's important in just a minute. So what are some examples of manageable housing? What does a, a good quality house look like? So uh, this is a um, pretty popular house that's been on the market for over 50 years now. Um, the Trio or Nature House uh, brand of Martin House, it's an aluminum house. Uh, they had the grandpa and the grandma model that were on the market for a long time. Some of the um, older uh, versions of this house have spaghetti railings across the top front of the porches. So the good thing about these trios is you can open the compartments. So there's a picture here where you see the door has swung open. So you can have access to this compartment to clean it out or, or do management, whatever you need to do there. So another example of um, good manageable housing is a Lone, Sco Lone Star Goliath. They also have a model called the Lone Star Alamo. And these you have, uh, have doors that will open for each compartment access here too. Another one that you may see is a, a T14 house. That's this style here. They can be made out of uh, wood or plastic. So how about gourds? They're also a great choice uh, for many different reasons. Um, the good thing about gourds is they tend to have reduced nest and porch domination. So what does that mean? Uh, oftentimes, if you just have up a martin house, you may not fill up all the compartments. And that's because the male martin will dominate the entire side of that house or the entire floor of that house and take over all the compartments. And it's harder for him to do that if he's um, separated a bit from his neighbors, which is what can happen with a gourd rack here. So you can get higher occupancy rate per pole. And so that's nice, a nice reason to have a gourd rack too. Um, with uh, gourds and the same thing with houses, they should be on a pulley or winch operated system for safety and for ease of use. And this picture here shows a um, pulley, um, rope and pulley system here. And we recommend that you use gourds with access caps because you need to be able to get in there and clean out, do nest inspections, et cetera. And it's a whole lot easier to do that if you have an access cap on the gourd. So how do you attract martins to your colony and what are some nest checking tools that you can use to do that? So attraction techniques. Martins are social birds. They want to nest with other martins. They are colony nesting species. So some things that will attract them to your site, you can play uh, the dawn song, which is a recording of a male martin singing very early in the morning. You can play that in the morning at your uh, colony site. Uh, generally, if you're trying to start a new colony, the best time to do that is in this area around April and May. That's your best chance of attracting a, a new martin to your site. Um, also, you can put up decoys on your house or um, gourd rack to make it look like the housing is occupied as an attraction technique. Now, once you do have a Purple Martin colony, there are some nest checking tools that the PMCA sells. Among those are the Purple Martin prognosticator here, which is this uh, white wheel. And uh, what that is, is it helps you calculate when eggs are due to hatch and when young are due to fledge from your site. And they also have laminated actual size pictures of uh, nestlings. If you open a gourd and it has young in it, you're not sure how old they are, you can figure it out with these pictures from the PMCA. This is a pretty cool um, uh, set that they offer here. Also, some people do nest cams. Uh, the PMCA has one that they uh, run every summer and it's a live feed 24 hours a day. There's some people who use blink cameras. They set those up in gourds and it can be a really fun and educational way to take a look inside and see what happens in a martin colony. So management and nest checks, why should you do nest checks? So the main reason to do nest checks is to check for problems and correct them. If you find a capped egg, you can save that egg. Now what a capped egg is, is when you've got an egg and a, another egg has hatched nest next to it, if the adults aren't removing that shell fast enough, that hatched egg can get stuck over an unhatched egg like this and act like a double shell and that can prevent that egg from hatching. You can catch that and correct that problem. 
If you find a dead martin in a nest, you can remove that or, or a dead young. If you find a martin that's been trapped in an entrance hole, sometimes they will fight at the beginning of the season, especially if the colony is uh, pretty full. They will fight over nesting cavities and they can sometimes get stuck and you can save their lives by doing a nest check. So you can check the percent occupation in a nest, in a nesting uh, cavity and colony. And just for the fact that nest checks are fun and they're educational. So definitely do that. And uh, I can talk to anybody more about what that entails if they have questions at the end. So other management practices. So being that they are a colony nesting species, they are prone to nest parasites. And uh, in this area that tip in North Carolina, what that typically looks like is a uh, nest mites. And the PMCA recommendation for that, if you have excessive nest mites, you'll see them like little tiny gray crawling dots over the surface of a house or over a gourd is you can replace the nest. And what that means is you take the young out, you put them in a bucket, like in this picture, you remove the old nest out, you wipe the whole cavity down with rubbing alcohol, and that'll kill most of the mites. Then you can put a fresh handful of clean pine straw in back into the cavity, put the young back in the cavity, and that will get rid of most of the parasites. Um, you, you really want to keep an eye on parasites because if the nest is overloaded with parasites, the young could get so irritated that they jump out of the nest. And if they're on the ground, they'll die. So it is something from a management perspective to keep an eye on. So optional things you can do for martins is you can supply calcium and grit to them. Um, you can put eggshells up on a platform feeder and they'll come down and get them. You can also uh, put uh, extra nest material on a raised platform. They will take uh, dry pine needles. They'll take small oak leaves like uh, willow oak or water oak leaves. They like that size of a leaf. And it's fun to see them come down and uh, take the nesting material you put out for them and take it back up to their nest. And that also helps keep them off the ground. So you want to keep them off the ground because that's where predators lurk. So let's talk about predators a little bit. You need to protect your martins from predators. Use pole guards or predator guards. Every birdhouse needs one, every birdhouse. So that means no matter what bird species you're hosting, bluebirds, wrens, chickadees, titmice, and definitely purple martins, you need a predator guard on that pole. Why? Because there are critters like raccoons and snakes and even squirrels that will predate on those birds. They can climb any unprotected pole. It doesn't matter if it's metal, it doesn't matter if it's square, wooden, anything. They can climb it. So how do you keep them from climbing that pole? So you can make or buy a baffle. So in this picture on the left, this is a stovepipe type baffle. And what you want that baffle to be is you want to make sure it's big and long enough. So it needs to be at least 24 inches long and at least eight inches in diameter. Uh, bigger is better. Um, oftentimes you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's and get a five foot long section of stovepipe, cut it in half, then you have enough stovepipe for two predator guards and then you can put the hardware cloth over the top. Now there are plans to build this baffle available on the web and I have a link to that on my website as well. You want to mount the predator guard so the top is at least four feet from the ground. Now, if you have a removable predator guard, it makes for easier management to raise and lower the housing. And there are commercial predator guards available you can buy that uh, snap on and off with the buckle so they can get out of the way for nest checks and those are nice to have. So the top of the guard being at least four feet off the ground, this is what this looks like. In this picture, you can see where this yellow line is. That's where you want your top of your guard to be. So this is your four foot line. If you can get it higher than that, even better. But again, this guard needs to be at least 24 inches long, at least eight inches wide. This is a commercial guard on this particular setup. And you wanna make sure that it's high enough off the ground and, and uh, that winches and pulleys are covered. So in this picture here, you will see this person's got a, um, a rope and pulley system. They've got the predator guard over it so that the snake or raccoon cannot use this cleat for the rope as a ladder to jump over the guard. So it's very important not to give predators a step stool underneath uh, predator guards to get around it. You don't want anything under that predator guard that they can use to get over top of it. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about nest site competitors. So there are two of them, and we're gonna do a little bit of birding by ear here first. You may have heard that bird in the Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart parking lot, et cetera.
That is the English house sparrow. So this is the male here in this picture on the bottom left, and this is a female in the top right. Now, English house sparrows are not native to North Carolina. Neither are European starlings. That's what a starling sounds like. Now, the problem with these two nest site competitors is they are extremely aggressive. They will destroy martin eggs, they will kill martin nestlings, and they will sometimes get into fights and kill adult martins too. So please never allow them to nest in martin housing. So the good news is you can keep starlings out with a special entrance called an SREH or starling resistant entrance hole. So here's just a few examples of those. Now the dimensions for the most common starling resistant entrance hole is shown here at the bottom. This is the crescent. So it's about a three inch circle on the bottom and one and three sixteenth inches from the top middle here. So this, di this dimension is very important. If it's any bigger than that, a starling can get in. If it's any smaller than that, a martin cannot get in. So a little bit more about starling resistant entrance holes. There are several different kinds on the market. The most common one that you see on the market now is the crescent. So that's this one on the top left here. Some others that you may see in commercially available uh, gourds or houses include the Excluder 2 or the Conley 2. So it's very important when you have an SREH or starling resistant entrance hole that the porch is mounted correctly on it. So you want your base of the crescent and your base of the porch to be very close together. So one eighth inch or less from the base of the crescent to the base of the porch. This prevents the starling from using their long legs to push inside the crescent. If this porch is much lower than that, then a starling can push himself in sideways. So that's why it's really important that this uh, porch be almost flush to the bottom of the SREH. So another predator that martins sometimes encounter is um, hawks and owls, aerial predators. And um, what there are two uh, species of owls that commonly uh, will attack martin colonies if you're going to have an owl problem, and those are great horned owls and barred owls. And there are things you can do to help protect against hawks and owls. Uh, Cooper's hawks are also another uh, common predator of uh, purple martins. And if you find that you're having trouble with them attacking your house or gourd rack, you can put caging around the house or gourd rack to help pre prevent attacks. There are um, owl prongs. Uh, you can also use these for hawks that are available commercially for some gourd racks. And you can also put up decoys. Um, oftentimes the hawk or owl will go after the slow martin and you want that slow martin to be the decoy and not your live martin. So what are some other birds that you may see? You may, you may think it's a martin or you may not be sure it's a martin. So here's some uh, purple martin imposters here. So we've got a barn swallow here on the left. So looks a little similar to a martin, but it's not a martin. They are not cavity nesting species. They build mud nests and they generally fly uh, lower than a martin does. They also have a deeply forked tail. Another one that's commonly confused with a martin is a tree swallow. Uh, tree swallows are also cavity nesting species like martins, but they have a, a white belly and white throat and then that dark back. They're also smaller than martins. So you may think, what, is, what else is that nesting in my, uh, my martin housing? What are some other native species that I might see? Uh, here we've got eastern bluebirds, uh, very common in this area of the state to, to have them try to uh, nest in martin housing or gourds if they don't have any other housing available. Some others that you may see include tree swallows, great crested flycatchers, titmice, etc. So what do you do if you've got a bluebird or a great crested flycatcher or any other native species that's trying to nest in your martin house? You do not want to let them nest in your martin house because what will happen is they will take over the martin housing and they will chase the martins away. So what you wanna do is provide housing for them separately. So what you do is put up housing about 30 feet, 30 to 60 feet is okay from your martin housing. Uh, you can put a bluebird house up for bluebirds or another extra gourd up for a tree swallow if they're trying to nest in your gourd rack. There is a, a protocol called the tri-habitation protocol that you can follow if you're having interference from bluebirds and tree swallows to keep them from uh, getting into your um, board rack or, or a purple martin house. 
So nest ID, let's say you're opening up your uh, Purple Martin um, house or gourd rack, you see a nest in there, but you're not sure what it is. So it, it helps to be able to identify what some nest characteristics are. So we've got the invasive house sparrow here on the top left. Notice this tunnel-like appearance. The nest is made of grass and it's really packed into that cavity. Over here, we've got the tree swallow. They tend to use a lot of feathers in their nest. And then compare that to the purple martin nest on the bottom left here. Again, you see the green leaves and the white colored eggs. And then we've got a starling nest here on the bottom right, a big, bulky, grassy nest here. That's a starling. So comparing eggs, let's say you open up a, uh, a gourd or a house compartment and you see eggs, you're not sure what you're looking at. So how to be a purple martin egghead. So A, B, C, and D are all purple martin eggs. So A is an old egg that's gotten dirty and hasn't hatched. B is an egg that has gotten capped. So remember earlier I talked about what happens if a hatched eggshell gets on top of an unhatched egg, it can prevent it from hatching. And that's what's happened here. C is a normally hatched egg with the two halves of the shell. And then D is an unhatched egg in the process of being incubated. Now compare that to a tree swallow egg. You can see the tree swallow egg is also white, but it's smaller than a martin's egg. And then F and G, F is a starling egg. Notice it is blue like the Eastern bluebird's egg, but the starling's eggs are much bigger than the bluebird's egg. And then H and I, H is a house sparrow. Again, that's a non-native invasive species like the European starling. And then I is a house wren. A few other examples of houses you may see, these are not martin nests. Uh, bluebird, again, you see the blue eggs and the straw cup-like nest here. Uh, chickadees and titmice tend to put moss in the bottom of their nesting cavities. Chickadees have spotted eggs, unlike the uh, bluebird or the uh, martin, and then house wrens tend to fill up compartments and houses with sticks. So you want to provide alternative housing for these native species so they aren't nesting in your martin house or gourds. So, so a little bit about some interesting uh, martin nesting locations. These things are not common, but they've been known to happen and just kind of make for interesting. So here in, in this uh, gas station in Tennessee, there were martins nesting in the B of the BP sign. And then over here in the street light in Orlando, Florida, you can see this female's peeking her head out of this uh, light right here on the right. And here's another example. We've got uh, some martins nesting here in some Spanish roof tiles. So that's all interesting and all, but you might wanna know what is a Martin landlord's goal? So the goal of a Martin landlord is to fledge healthy, strong, young, and they can do that with housing that is healthy for them. That's the right size, that's well ventilated, that's not dirty, that's not full of mites, et cetera. And we want to fledge healthy, strong, young because Martins depend on us east of the Rocky Mountains to provide housing for them. They very rarely nest in natural cavities anymore east of the Rocky Mountains. That's Prognisubus subus, that, that subspecies I talked about earlier. That's what we have here on this side of the country. So the average success rate, egg to fledge success is about 50%, but in good years, and especially in managed housing where you're checking for problems, et cetera, that can be um, 70, 80%, sometimes 85% success rate. So managing the housing does help. So a little bit more about um, the Martin's future. So what does the NCPMS do? So what we're involved in is uh, scientific research through banding and tagging projects. We do have a um, banding project. We're doing just color bands um, every summer. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in another picture. Uh, we do uh, public outreach uh, through social media, educational events like this one, and then conservation projects, which is hands-on public Martin sites. And I'll talk about where you can find those if you're in the Wake Camp County area of North Carolina. So why should you get involved with Martins? Because as I talked about earlier, management leads to increased nesting success. The good thing about Martins is they will not abandon nests when, it's, when they're inspected. If you lower a house for nest checks, they will often just sit on the very top of the house or land nearby and just wait for you to finish. And then as soon as you're finished, they'll go right back in. Monitoring nests and keeping records is good practice and it is recommended by the PMCA that you do this. So how can you get involved with Martins in Wake County? So uh, in Wake County, which is uh, where I am, you can see uh, some various uh, Martin colonies. 
Um, on the left here, we've got a, a gourd rack at Yates Mill Pond Park. We're still trying to establish an active colony site there. Uh, we have one at uh, Prairie Ridge Eco Station, which is currently managed by the museum. We have one at uh, NCSU Faculty Club, which is also called University Club in Raleigh. That's uh, next to the vet school. There are two gourd racks out there. And then we have a gourd rack at Sug Farm Park in Holly Springs. So if you'd like to see Martins this spring and early summer, those are some good places to see them. And you can get involved in those public sites too. You can volunteer with us. So how can you get involved? So there are some things that we would love for you to do if you're interested in helping out with us. So what we need is people to help with nest checks. We need people to um, help with seasoning opening, uh, season closing, take down, clean out, special projects, et cetera. So um, in, in about two and a half weeks, I'm gonna start the process of putting up gourds at gourd racks here, like you see in this picture here. So if you're interested in doing that, we can get you involved as a volunteer to help assemble at the beginning of the season to hang up the Martin housing. We do not leave it up all year long because it lasts better when it's taken care of out of the weather. Uh, we can also use helpers taking down and cleaning out at the end of the season. If you want to come over with us while the Martins are there and help with nest checks, you can come and um, help us take records. We send all of our re records from nest checks to the PMCA so they can track uh, purple Martin populations within the country. So please be involved. They need us. So here on the top left, uh, you can see a picture there of the uh, banding projects that we do. This is just an example of one uh, we did one year out of University Club with this group. And uh, we have a licensed bander from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences who comes out and does this with us. And we kind of have an assembly of people. We have some people uh, bring nestlings out of gourds and then we bring them over to the researchers and they weigh them. And then they put their, um, their tags on, their bands on, and then they record that data. And what we're looking for every year is for returning nestlings that come back the, the following year as sub-adults to see how many of them return to our site or you may find banded martins at your site somewhere else in North Carolina. And if you do find one, please let us know, especially if you can read the band number, that would be very helpful to us. Another way you can get involved is um, helping us out at uh, public events, or you could visit us at a booth or a table that we have set up. Um, we have uh, youth that have gotten involved in Purple Martin projects. Uh, these are some scout groups here on these pictures down here. And we've had uh, youth from schools come out with us while we've done nest checks. It's um, a nice way to integrate science education. They're, they're easy to study, they're fun to watch, and they're very social birds. So um, public Martin projects are nice because they help increase awareness of Purple Martins. It's nice because it's not just somebody's um, Martin colony in their backyard. It's in a place where everybody can see them and everybody enjoy, can enjoy them. So if you don't have a good spot in your own backyard for a Purple Martin colony, you might consider sponsoring a community Martin project in your own town. And as I mentioned earlier, schools are another possibility. They could offer opportunities for combining education and conservation. So that might be um, consideration for you as well. So just remember that Purple Martins need our help to thrive. And we hope that you would consider putting up Purple Martin housing or volunteering with us today. And thank you. Thank you, Courtney. That was a really interesting presentation. I, um, I know, remember the first time I saw a Purple Mountain, uh, a Purple Martin condo. I didn't really know what it was. It kind of just looked like someone had, had built a house just for fun and put it up in the sky. But um, <laughs> looks like we have a, a ton of questions here. So I guess I'll just go ahead and get started with the first one. This one's from John. Um, he asked, do different subspecies interbreed? Um, they have not been known to interbreed, and I think that's basically because of the geographic boundaries that separate them. And also the fact that there is a very slight physical difference between the three subspecies. The uh, Prognisubis um, arboricola, the far western subspecies, is slightly bigger than Prognisubis subis. Um, Prognisubis hesperia has not been known to nest in anything except um, holes in cacti. And um, interestingly enough, uh, I believe it's the Tucson Audubon Society has been trying to research 
projects into getting these martins for conservation reasons to start nesting in human supplied housing that emulates a cactus hollow. So there is a uh, research being done on that, but to my knowledge, there has never been any documented occurrence of hybridization between the three species. And that, that kind of goes into a question that, that I had that I wanted to ask you. So, I mean, um, where are there, I guess, the most gaps in purple martin research? So like, in other words, what, what needs to be studied in your opinion? Oh, there's, there's a lot of things that could be studied. Um, I think right now what we're noticing is we've had a lot of severe weather incidences. We've had a lot of very hot summers. We've had a lot of very uh, cold early spring and these weather events, they really affect the Martins. So there's been a little bit of research done as to which housing types are better for Martins to survive weather. I think there should be more research done on that. I think there should be more research done on what the purple Martins are eating in our local area and uh, what they may be ingesting with those insects, if there are an, any um, toxicity exposures, that could be uh, an issue. Um, that's definitely something that needs to be studied as well. So we do have, yeah, a bunch of questions, but this one seems to be, um, seems like this question's been asked a couple times. So why do they no longer use natural cavities uh, and would purple martin survive as a species without the ongoing intervention by people? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So uh, what happened was par purple martins went through this very gradual process where they imprinted on housing provided by man, either purple martin houses or gourd racks. And that's what they came to look for and that's what they came to rely on. And again, remember, um, to, for anyone who may not be familiar with this, that this imprinting process on uh, gourd racks and houses started way before uh, Europeans arrived to North America. So it had been going on for quite a while. Um, another reason that they aren't nesting in natural cavities as much anymore is one, lack of habitat. There just aren't a lot of dead snags around anymore that are in the right place. Uh, there's been a lot of deforestation and, and cutting of trees, et cetera. The other is there has been a lot of competition with um, other species for housing, especially um, with house sparrows and European starlings. There have been a lot of competition um, with any remaining nest cavities. So that is another issue why they're not doing that as much anymore. There just aren't that many uh, natural cavities available for them to use. So Haley has a question here. Um, does opening the gourds not bother the birds? Good question. Uh, no, it does not bother the, the birds. Uh, but the way that I like to do it is, first of all, let them know I'm coming. I make no effort to sneak up on them at all. When I walk up to a colony site, I will talk to them. I will tap on the pole and then I will gently lower the housing. I don't try to do anything fast and jerky. And usually, talking to them and tapping on the pole. Most of the time, uh, if a female is in there incubating or if there are nestlings in there, that will have them either hunker down or the female will fly out temporarily and then they'll wait for you to be finished with whatever you need to do. Um, what you need to watch for is nest checks when the um, nestlings are past 26 days of age. They get to the age where they can be jumpy at that point and then you have to be a little careful at that age. But um, the thing is that Martins are so um, happy to be around people and they're so calm around people, generally speaking, that they're easy to study and they are not really disturbed by nest checks at all. They may um, squawk a little bit, but they'll go right back. So you don't have to worry about them abandoning a nest just because it's like that. So John had another question here. Do South American countries have um, purple Martin conservation programs? So the PMCA has been working with some researchers in South America, and because the Martins are spending our winters over there, they aren't worrying about nesting conservation in Brazil, they're worrying about roost site conservation. So they have been working with some researchers uh, down there with some of the universities trying to figure out where these Martins are roosting and what conservation implications that may have. So it's ongoing research. And this question comes from Haley. How do you know if there are parasites? So if you are doing nest checks regularly, which is recommended uh, by the PMCA every five to seven days, I usually do them about every seven days because I'm just a very busy person otherwise, you will see them. 
So if you're lowering your gourd rack or lowering your house and you see something that looks like little tiny black dots or little tiny brown dots running all over the surface of the house or the gourd, then you've got, you've got nest mites. So you'll know. <laughs> Jean asks, um, can one use a diluted solution of bleach to clean the nest box or just rubbing alcohol? So if you're just trying to get rid of the mites, then it's just suggested to use rubbing alcohol because it evaporates quickly and doesn't leave any residue that might affect the birds. Now, at the end of the season, you can use a diluted bleach, season, bleach solution to clean out the housing, and that's perfectly fine, about a 10% solution at the end of the season when the birds are not present. So this question comes from Jane. Um, they have a couple questions. So how many birds define a colony? Start with that one, if you can. And then um, is avian influenza a problem with this species? So how many birds start off a colony? So um, most people, some people are, are luckier than that, but most people, when they get uh, their first pair, they may just have one or two pairs that very first season, and that's all that they have that first year. And then that colony gradually grows in size. Now, as to whether that colony continues to grow and stays healthy depends on how well that person manages the site. If, if it has nice wide open flyways, if they protected it from predators to keep uh, snakes or raccoons from climbing that pole. Um, snake or raccoon can wipe out your colony and it'll totally be gone. So it's important to protect the martins you do have. Now as far as um, making sure that you have surviving birds that migrate back to your colony in the spring, there are a lot of numbers that float around about that. Generally six to eight pairs is recommended to be a sustainable amount to guarantee that at least some of those adults will survive migration and come back to your site again in the next year. What was the question after that? The second question was, is uh, avian influenza a problem with the species? I have not read any documented paperwork that says that it is. That is, um, I can't say that it isn't, but I haven't heard of any cases so far where it is, but I'm sure there is research ongoing about that. So are there any purple martin colonies in Durham um, near South Point Mall that you know of? <laughs> I know of a couple in Durham. I don't remember exactly where they are. Uh, but if the, the person who's asking uh, wants to go on the uh, PMCA Scout Report uh, website, they can look at the reports for 2022, and that will tell them anywhere in Durham that a, that a colony has had a scout report. So they can check that and see what there is. But oftentimes there are people that just have martins in their backyard and they don't report them to the PMCA uh, Scout Report. So there, there's always that possibility that there are more martins in your backyard and you just don't know about it. So you take a drive and go look. And um, Jeremy's wondering if a purple martin um, colony would work in Charlotte. It would definitely work in Charlotte if you have the right location. So it's not just about the city, it's more about the flyways, if it's a nice open area, et cetera. So I uh, maintain a colony site near downtown Raleigh. So can they live in urban areas? Yes, as long as the habitat is correct. That's the most important, most important factor. So I know these are kind of rapid fire. Feel free to cut me off if you, if you want, but we still got some more questions here. Um, so this one is, are metal houses too hot to use and would gourds be better? That's a great question. Um, there are ways to make metal houses better. If you have a, um, a metal house, first of all, you want to make sure it's painted white because here in the Southeast, um, first of all, Purple Martin colonies are in full sun. So yes, it gets hot here in the summer. If they're white, they're going to reflect the sun better. Um, another thing you can do is you can add insulation. You can add a, a, a layer of wood paneling underneath to help deflect that radiant heat from coming through the metal. You want to make sure there's ventilation holes in the, the housing under the eaves of the roof. You can install um, even elbows, ventilation elbows and gourds too. So I wouldn't necessarily say that they're too hot, but it depends on the size of the compartments in the house and if they're insulated and if they have ventilation features, those are all important too. So Haley has another question here. Do they care if the houses are by a road? It's not that, not that they care, but I would call it a safety issue possibly for fledging time. So you wanna think about where the flyways are for your Purple Martin site. And if your most wide open flyway would have them flying directly into traffic, that might be an issue. And you might wanna think about siting that uh, Martin colony elsewhere or a little further back from the road. It's not that they're scared by a road, it's more of a safety issue for them if it's one of their main flyways. So that is something to consider. 
So Jennifer has a couple of questions here. How long can it take to attract Purple Martins to a site? Quite a while. That's the <laughs> yes, that's the million dollar question. I could tell you my own personal story. I know people who, who took longer than I did. So I have my own Martin Colony at home and then I maintain several public Purple Martin sites in Wake County where I live. Um, it took me nine years to get a colony established at home. Um, but I know some people who get them their first year of trying. So it really depends on a couple of things. One, how good is your site? How open are the flyways? And two, how dense is the Purple Martin population in your particular area? If you can drive around within five miles of your house or wherever it is you want to put that Purple Martin colony and you see other active Purple Martin colony sites, your chances of getting established are going to be higher because there's more Martins in your area. Especially they're going to be higher if you have a good wide open site. If your site is tree encroached, then it's going to be harder for you for you to attract martins. And so this seems to be a little bit more personal of a question. How did you get interested in purple martins and want to start an organization for their conservation? <laughs> oh, that's a long story. I'll try to make it a, as short as I can. Um, I remember when I was a child, um, we were down on the Pungo River one summer. We were visiting some friends. And if you know where the Pungo River is, cool points to you. It's a beautiful area. And um, one of the neighbors had a purple martin house and I had never seen that before. And the, the birds were sitting on their house and we were walking right under them and they were just sitting there looking at us. And I thought they had the most beautiful song. And I thought, I just got to learn all I can about this cool bird. So I sat on the friend's porch and I watched these martins for quite a while. And um, as time passed, I never forgot about those Martins. Uh, years came and went, and then I finally was able to live in an area where it was an appropriate habitat for me to have my own Martin colony, so I got back into it again. Now, as far as starting our own group, so I've been a member of the PMCA, which is the national organization for many years, and I noticed there were other uh, regional groups around North America and some in Canada for uh, purple martin conservation, but there were none in North Carolina that I knew of. So I was interested in starting up an organization in North Carolina, and I met another fellow named Tim Francis who also had the same interest. So uh, together we we uh, worked as a team and we got this going. So what would you say, um, like what aspects of the Pur Mar Pur Mar Purple Martin Society have been, I guess, most successful so far, and um, what would you like to see improved in the future? So what aspects of the society? Yeah, have been most successful, would you say? Well, I'd say um, uh, outreach events like this one, um, public uh, events that we do, uh, banding and things where people can come and watch us work with the colonies. Um, kids especially enjoy that, being able to come right up and, and see inside a Purple Martin nest and watch us work with them. Uh, they really enjoy that. What's the other part of the question? Uh, the other part was just, um, what would you like to see improved in the future? Uh, what I'd like to see improved in the future is I would love more boots on the ground. I would love more volunteers to come help me. So <laughs> definitely, if you're interested, let me know. Well, it looks like we've gotten through all the questions. Maybe just, just one more that I had here. Um, so what role do you think, um, what role will Purple Martins play uh, in the larger effort to conserve birds as a whole? I think they're an indicator species, meaning that they're an insectivorous species. If we, as we see their populations decline, it could, it could show us a, a wider decline in uh, insectivorous species and in birds in general. So I think it's important that we watch their numbers because they are an indicator of how healthy the ecosystem is. Well said, well said. Well, Kathy says, if you're up for a road trip to learn more about Martins, come to Central Virginia for the annual Purple Martin Field Day. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. <laughs> Well, it seems like they, all the questions were answered here. If uh, Monty or John want to pop in and say something, if not, then um, this will be the conclusion of this event. Thank you, Courtney, so much for your time. And um, everyone who signed up will receive a recording and we'll um, hope to see everyone again soon. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.